and the things that are on the right side of the equation are called the products. Reactants are the things that are reacting together. Products are the things that are produced. Okay. The symbols and formulas are meant to represent the different chemical, either compounds or the molecules that are represented in this chemical equation. Now, in a chemical equation, it's important to notice that in any chemical equation, this is uh, one particular chemical might be a toxin. A toxin can enter the body in a limited number of ways. Okay? Toxins are limited with how they can enter the body, and it depends on what state of matter the toxin is in. For example, if you had a solid toxin, how could it enter your body? Hey, if you ate it, very good. If you ingested it, it could enter your body. Okay. If you touch something that was solid, it's possible as well, but it's much harder to go through your skin. Okay. Doesn't mean it's not possible, but much harder for many toxins. Now, toxins often react with what in the human body? With water. Now, since the body, the human body is an aqueous environment, water is found throughout your human body. So if it can get into the water in your human body, then it can affect many different areas or certain areas. Toxins may be molecular, ionic, or metallic substances. These are three of the four bond types we know of currently. What's the fourth one that's not listed here? Covalent network, very good. So a network covalent. Now let's imagine we ingested a diamond. Doesn't sound so nice, but you ate a diamond by accident or intentionally. The question is, would it be toxic to you? And what do we know about diamonds? They're a network. And so if it's a covalent network, what other properties might they have? Doesn't dissolve. Doesn't break down easily. So it goes into your mouth. What's it going to do as it goes down your throat? It might get stuck. What else do you know about diamonds in particular? They're very hard. So, very hard. So if you do swallow a diamond, for example, not that you would want to, it's possible, depending on how big it was, of course, as you swallow it, it can go down and it could cut up your throat. Or as it's going out your small intestine, which isn't as big as your throat, it could go out and cut some things as it's going out of your system. Chemically, doesn't have the reactivity, doesn't tend to dissolve in water, but they, it would then tend not to be what's classified as a toxic substance. So silicon, silicon is also something okay, that tends to be non-toxic, okay, non-toxic as well. So these different compounds, again, if they are not covalent molecular, ionic, or metallic, they may not be toxic. Now, if we look at our toxin types, we can see up here, the first group that you sorted things into were the molecular toxins, okay? The molecular toxins, they had damage to the eyes, nose, throat, and the lungs. These molecular toxins enter the body through the mucus, so in your mouth or in your nose. These molecular compounds often produce acids and what are called hydroxide compounds. Another type of compound that can be uh, produced when a molecule enters your body is you can, when it reacts with oxygen in the air, it can, it can uh, form what's called blood acidosis. And that's when an acid forms in the blood, your blood becomes more acidic than it is meant to be and that can have severe damage over your entire body as the blood spreads throughout your body. But that's when the molecules react with oxygen in the air, so you breathe them in. So you breathe these in. On number three, this is when you have metals or ionic compounds. Okay? 
ingestion of a metal, which is unfortunately common with children, is if they eat a metal. What happens is it goes into the stomach and it reacts with the hydrochloric acid. The hydrochloric acid in the stomach breaks down this metal or ionic compound to produce a uh, metal chloride. The metal chloride is usually aqueous. So this metal chloride once was in your stomach, now it's aqueous, which means it can spread throughout your entire body. Not a good thing. You ate a solid, and now the metal from this solid as an ion with chlorine is spreading throughout your entire body. And that metal doesn't just disappear. It'll stay in your body. Okay? What does that metal do? One of the primary things that metal do is it messes up the conductivity of your nerves. Nerves include potassium, lithium, as ions for the ion channels to send electrical signals through your nerves. So if you get nerve damage, where are a lot of your nerves located? A lot of them can be communicated to the neurons in your brain. So nerves connect again to the neurons. They also need ions to function properly. If you give them the wrong ions, you can have nerve damage. So if you eat a metal or an ionic compound that can be damaging, you can have severe nerve damage. And that's why it's a really bad idea to eat lead, for example. That's why they took lead out of pencils. Uh, why your, your pencil should be made out of graphite, not lead anymore. And the last type of reaction, which is a very common reaction, although it's hard to predict, is when you have a molecular or an ionic compound that reacts with calcium chloride. When it reacts with calcium chloride, this, is, this forms a solid. This solid is a solid calcium compound which makes what's called a kidney stone. A kidney stone occurs when if this is your kidney, and here's the exit out of your body, the very small and narrow opening. If you have a really big kidney stone, <coughs> You're trying to put a solid substance through a very small tube. This solid substance can't get through the tube, so it gets stuck. If it gets stuck, you get an infection because all of the waste, the liquid waste in your body is trying to exit out through this tube. So this year, All the liquid waste is trying to exit. Now, kidney stones, unfortunately, there's a lot of chemistry in how a kidney stone forms. It is a solid. It forms inside your body from two liquids. So once this kidney stone forms, though, it does not tend to dissolve. It is a solid, insoluble compound. It is not soluble in water. So the problem you have is now you have a stone or a solid, it's called a stone. The size of these things is incredibly small, but it's still trying to get out a very small tube. So this big, bigger solid is trying to get out a tube that's only meant for liquid waste. Most of the solids that go come out of your body come out your backside. The liquid waste is supposed to come out your front side. The problem with that is kidney stones are solid going through where a liquid's supposed to go because you have this solid. There are an incredible number of nerves right around here too, and when this solid tries to go through here, it rips and breaks that tube open, and the amount of pain is immense. The only thing more painful than kidney stones is childbirth, according to some uh, women. <coughs> kidney stones are usually referred to as the most painful thing for men. For women, it's like, oh, what was that? No big deal. But, that's at least what I've heard. I'm not going to say anything more about that. But kidney stones, unfortunately, unfortunately, have a lot more uh, chemistry and some uh, biology behind them. So you, you would probably want, some people want to say, well, what compounds here would I want to avoid to avoid kidney stones? Uh, the problem is some people are more, uh, more likely to get kidney stones than others, no matter what type of things you eat.
Um, but there are some ways of reducing it. So if your parents had kidney stones, chances are you might have them as well, just by how your body processes the ions and the solids. So chemists can keep track of changes in matter. The first way they do that is by chemical equations. So any of these biological implications are all governed by chemical equations. Uh, they use formulas to indicate the reactants and products. They also show what phase the compound is in. Sometimes it's good to have something as a solid. Other times you don't want it to be a solid. Okay? So if you have a solid, if you have liquid going out your solid waste or solids going out your liquid waste, those aren't good things. You don't want those to happen. So there are reasons why certain things are solids and liquids and why you want them there. Now, toxins are substances that interact with living organisms and cause harm. So these toxins here are the ones that could cause harm most likely to a, a human. And these are some of the ones we're going to look at in our first in our unit on toxins. Now, speaking of toxins, let's consider this reaction. I would like you to do part A and B right now on your paper to check in. You can use your cards if you need to, but please do part A and B based on this information on this substance. All right, let's look and see how we can interpret this reaction. Now, one thing you can use anytime you're dealing with chemical reactions is your green ion <coughs> sheet and periodic table. So an interpretation of the chemical equation. This would be a verbal description of what is happening in this substance. So the first thing we need to know are what are the names of these four different compounds for this interpretation. So the first compound here, what is this one called? Okay, sodium cyanide. Now, it also gave us the name there. Isn't that nice? <laughs> Good. Don't have to look it up. It's great. And a solution of what's this one? Hydrochloric acid. Okay, hydrochloric acid. And then it produces, so you've got sodium cyanide solid plus hydrochloric acid solution produces, what's this one going to be? Okay, a solution of? Sodium chloride. Let's just call it a salt because there are lots of salts besides sodium chloride. It's called table salt, but we could describe it that way, but sodium chloride is better. And what else is produced? Yeah, hydrogen cyanide gas. Now, since it's a gas and not aqueous, it is not cyanic acid. Hydrocyanic acid. If it was aqueous, it'd be hydrocyanic acid. But since it's a gas, it's called hydrogen cyanide. Now, this substance here, sodium cyanide, is highly toxic. So what do you think, how do you think it will get into the body? How could it get into the body? What's a possible way? Yeah. If you eat it. If you eat it, because it's a solid, that's a way for it to get into the body. Also, what's it react with? Okay, yeah, hydrochloric acid. Where's hydrochloric acid found? In your stomach. In your stomach. Okay, so the good news is, if you don't ingest it, can this react with hydrochloric acid? No, so you can hold it in your hand. Now, on James Bond movies and all sorts of other war movies, and crazy all sorts of other movies, they talk about this chemical. Okay, they just call it cyanide for short. Cyanide pills. You can hold them in your hand and be completely safe. But when you ingest them, the out of sodium of the pill dissolves, and the sodium cyanide reacts with hydrochloric acid, and it produces sodium chloride, which isn't bad for you, and hydrogen cyanide, which is extremely toxic. Hydrogen cyanide, the CN here, Okay, this reacts very quickly with water and produces the cyanic acid, and it also reacts with individual cells. So every single cell in your body, in order for the cell to operate properly, hydrogen ions move across the cell membrane. If they are not balanced out, there's a differential in the cell membrane, hydrogen ions will move. 
if you have cyanide, what that does is it shuts down those hydrogen ions from moving across the cell, and the cell automatically dies very quickly. So that is a very dangerous chemical. That's why we didn't do this experiment in class. Yep. So is that only sodium cyanide or is it potassium cyanide? Ah, there would be a similar reaction with potassium cyanide because potassium and sodium are both bound on the same material chain. Now, which one? Sodium cyanide or potassium cyanide would be more reactive? Well, potassium is a bigger, because it's further down the periodic table, and these tend to be more reactive in general as you go down. So you can imagine K KCN would probably be um, more reactive in that respect. Um, however, both of them would equally, both re would react with hydrochloric acid. One might be faster in terms of the rate of reaction, and that would cause a quicker rate of whatever the case could be. So, uh, the interesting thing about this substance, though, is not many people have smelled it, but the people that have smelled it said it smells like um, smells like almonds. You may be asking, well, how could somebody smell that? Well, it does smell like almonds. Uh, it, it is actually uh, this is actually produced by almonds, so that um, so that other insects will not be uh, be almonds. So there's many, uh, many different biological reasons and biological reasons that this is produced naturally. Uh, it's usually a deterrence to keep other, um, other uh, insects away. Um, but it is something that is unique. It does have a smell, but it's not something you want to smell. So if you do smell something that smells like almonds and you think somebody might have had some cyanide around you, please run. Any questions, clarifications? Now, in this lab, we saw a number of different changes that happened in the lab, okay? There are two types of changes we could have seen in any of these chemical reactions. One are called physical changes. These are changes in the appearance or form of a substance. Chemical changes produce new substances with new properties. So a physical change is a change in matter in which a substance changes form but not identity. So it has the same formula, but something about it changes. Maybe it goes from a solid to a liquid, or a liquid to an, uh, a gas, or aqueous to a solid, or something like that. Or maybe it just gets ripped in half. That would be a physical change as well. And a chemical change, as it says up here, is a change in matter that results in the formation of a new substance or substances with new properties. They must be new substances with new properties in order for there to be a chemical change that happens. Sometimes it's difficult to know what the properties are, but if you have a new substance, you know it's a chemical change. To differentiate between physical and chemical changes, I uh, use a very easy mnemonic for me to remember, and that's called the FAA. Now, when I think of chemistry, sometimes I think of explosion, and that's just my personal experience with chemistry. It has nothing to do with you personally. But, in my face, I'm not that stupid. I don't make bad decisions. Safety is number one priority. So, explosions are not meant to happen in your face or anyone else's face. Um, well, that's all other story if you're trying to do it intentionally, but you should not, ever. Safety is number one priority in the chemistry lab. You never want to test something out you don't know what it does. So, the FAA, however, also is very concerned with safety. The FAA is concerned with safety when you, uh, how many of you have ever uh, seen an airplane or flown on an airplane before? Uh, if you haven't flown on an airplane or seen one, uh, there are people behind the scenes that guide the airplanes so that they do not crash. Okay? These people are known as, uh, they work for the FAA. Sometimes they're called air traffic controllers. There's many other people that work in the FAA. Now, 
Unfortunately, when there is a crash, everybody blames the FAA. It's not always their fault, but people blame them or blame somebody else. It's always blame. So when a plane crashes, there's usually, unfortunately, a big explosion, at least in the movies. So an explosion is an example of a chemical change. So when I think of FAA, the F stands for formula. The A stands for atoms or arrangement of atoms. So, if the atoms are switched, you get a different, you have a chemical change. If the arrangement of atoms is switched, you get a chemical change. If the formula is different, you get a what? Chemical change. If the FAA doesn't change, then it's called a physical change. That's it. Okay. So, formula, atoms, or arrangement of atoms. Most of the time, formula and atoms go together. So, looking at the F first, if you look at this reaction here, hydrochloric acid plus sodium bicarbonate produces sodium chloride solution, liquid water, and carbon dioxide gas. The first question is, do the formulas stay the same? Do the formulas change? Good. If the formulas change, what type of change is this? Chemical change, excellent. Now, ionic compounds do not dissolve in the same way as molecular solids, though. Molecular solids, when they dissolve, they don't break apart into smaller pieces. Sugar, when put in water, the sugar stays together. Salt, when put in water, the salt actually dissolves and separates. So, in our lab, we saw NaCl aqueous, and we heated it up. And what did that produce? Okay, sodium chloride, and what phase was it? Solid, does the formula change from here to here? No. The aqueous changes, the solid formula stays the same. The atoms stay the same, the arrangement of the atoms stay the same. So what type of change is this? Physical change. All right, what about this one here? Physical. What about this one here? That one is called a chemical change. Now, the real, real tricky part about this, and these are the why these are a little bit gray, is if you put solid salt in water, it makes this. If you put solid salt in water, it makes this. So these two are the exact same event. Two equations for one thing happening. If they're the same thing happening, you add salt to water, is salt to water going to be a physical change or a chemical change? Whoa. All depends on how you write it. Technically speaking, when you add salt to water, the salt formula changes. So it is actually defined as a chemical change. But if you write it like this, it's called a what? Physical change. So that's the gray area. Be aware of that gray area. If we write it like this, it's called chemical. If we write it like this, it's called physical. Those are the trickiest ones to figure out. Everything else is, does the formula change? If it does, it's chemical. Doesn't change, physical, boom, we're done, that's it. Doesn't matter if the phases change, the formula stays the same, it's physical. So now that we know about physical and chemical changes, we're gonna make some predictions by observing some changes. So let's consider this chemical equation here. I would like you to do letter A, right up here, letter A, write your answer down. Do not do B, don't do it, don't, excuse me, do not do B, don't do B, do not do it. Oh, one other thing, just in case, don't even think about doing B. I'm thinking about it now, don't do it, stop it. Stop thinking about B, do not do B. Do not write an interpretation of the chemical equation. You don't want to do that. Don't want to describe what's taking place. Tell me why you do A. Ready, set, go. <laughs> what? You don't want to do B? What? You don't want to do B. Just do A. Yeah. To be or not to be? To be or not to be? Uh, not to be today. Today. To do A, to do A, today.
Don't even think about doing B. I know you're thinking about it. Just write down your answer to A only. Describing the products, what would the reactions look like before you put them together? Okay, maybe clear, liquid, maybe they'd be cold. Okay, maybe they'd be colored, you may not know that, but clear liquids for these. Okay. So if we perform this reaction, trying to describe what you would observe, you did a very good job describing that. Not one of you wrote an interpretation of the chemical equation. Because if you didn't do this part, because I told you not to, an interpretation would be silver nitrate solution plus potassium chloride solution produces potassium nitrate solution and solid silver chloride. That would be an interpretation of the equation. Now, if you didn't have this equation and you were mixing two liquids together and got a solid, if you didn't know what the liquids were, could you know what the solid is? No. That would be very difficult to do that. There's other ways we have to do that. So there are limitations to chemistry because the chemical equation doesn't always tell you everything and your observations don't always tell you everything. So they are related, but they are not the same thing. So interpretation is the chemical names and formulas and explanation. And A is just what you would actually see. So today we're going to look at a few reactions and what we will actually see. So how can you predict what you will observe based on a chemical equation and relate chemical equations to real world observations, what you see versus the reaction? You'll be able to make predictions based on chemical equations and test them out. So you're going to predict the future and then test it. Okay? You're going to be working in groups of actually four to eight people. Four people work really well. However, you will be sharing equipment with multiple other groups. So the way it's going to work is there are two stations you'll be doing. In lab number two, it says that we're doing three stations. Three has been changed to two due to budgetary constraints. All right? You will not be working with dry ice, so you don't have to worry about these things touching your fingers, although I don't want you to touch any of these chemicals if possible. You want to wear safety goggles at all times. Over here is station number three. Station number three is here. There are instructions. There are um, testing containers. And there are the chemicals. This here is a waste speaker. Excuse me, sit down, all of you. 
everyone. This is the uh, waste container, which is here. This says waste for three. So that means you put the waste for three in here, not the waste for two. This is a wash bottle. There are many other wash bottles around the room. They only contain distilled water. So if it asks you to add water to it, add the distilled water here. Now, uh, the instructions on some of the things say add an inch of water or an inch of chemical. Please don't add an inch of anything. Okay? The test tubes are relatively small, so you only need to add probably about a centimeter most of the time. Do not add more than a centimeter of any chemical because you don't have a ton of it. And the water, you can add more water if you need to, but we're still low on water and it costs money, so we don't have enough water either, which is kind of sad, but it's true. Okay? So just be aware of that as you make your observations. You're going to make predictions, and then you're going to test them out, and then you're going to clean up your glassware. When your glassware is clean, it should be clean and put back in the test tube racks. If you need an additional test tube, they are all located up here. You may use any of the test tubes in this bin or the ones on your rack for the experiment. I will get a few more test tube racks for you to use. Over here. And you may get into groups of uh, four to six people to work together on this and get your goggles on and begin. Ready, set, go.